would like to invite Ms. Karishma Mehta, SAS Woman of Mumbai, and Ms. Manisha Jain, Branding and Communication Chief of Prabhatyatan Foundation, to join us for the release of the book. Before we begin, I'd like to request everyone to please turn your mobile phones into this phone and switch off mode or into turn it on silent. I'd like to request Mr. Deshpande to please start the conversation with Mr. Thank you. Pure I don't know when this really happened. I heard that the music doesn't need words and the book needs only words. And when you see the title is A Country Called Childhood, when does really vocabulary happen? I think life happens first, then we work. And as we grow with our experiences and understanding, we analyze our emotions and put them in human perspective. Shavanaji saw me with her and she said, Do abstract looks up in the working it. <laughs> now, I love this because now I'm feeling comfortable. <laughs> no, it's so important really that uh, when you read something and so, so close to life and yet on I just asked her that there are eight lines written on the first, the very first page. What is it? She said, I wanted to write something about the beginning and the first thing happened to her was a poem. And then I remember a line said by Bakoski, the poet, that his one poem, the strength of a poem, is equivalent to the entire Hollywood industry. So now whether we go into the technical understanding of what did he mean, but it is the strength of other expanse of poem which just opens layers beyond your words and beyond your comprehension and that's where I feel is fascinating when I started reading this book. I told her, seldom do you really feel that you, you read something and you, you cry and you laugh and really it evokes so quickly and it's a matter of say half a page and you, you are amused, you are engaged and there's no exaggeration what I'm saying. And that does not mean, you know, normally we say as a simple reading, easy reading, that's not the point. Have you seen life? And that's what fascinates me that at the age of four, how could she just see life? I mean, I don't even remember when I was four. I don't think I was ever four. <laughs> yeah, I remember life from 40 maybe. You know? It took me many years to understand what I have lived and put it across maybe through plays, and to write engaging book. I'll just start with this. 
first poem, which is like happens to a first. Eight lines. Would you like to read? Because we really want her to say the first line, which will. That's an important line. We will say that. Yeah. No, no. Melody rushes back at times, pulls me by my finger, eggs me on and says, come, let's go. Inside those dark chambers, where you stood in the light, rejoicing in a life yet to be unfold. I'll just write, uh, say two more lines because uh, she's written the book in five sections. Well, the note about the book she says it is it's, it could have easily been named as stories from my childhood and not a memoir. And uh, what she means is her life is full of stories. And stories, I don't nurture them, they nurture me. That's what she said. So now to the prologue, and it's called the dance of songs over to Shabanaji. The dance of songs. It's getting dark in the city of Amritsar. Shops are shutting down. Street lamps come on, casting dim yellow pools of light. Rickshaws and bicycles hustle to make their way home. A handcart loaded with gun bags wobbles down the street. Even Dwarka's kite shop is winding up. The old Sardar tailor pulls his rickety shutter down, gets on his bicycle and pedals away. Shami's voice can be heard. She's urging her buffaloes home. Grubby little boys, the mochis, play outside in the gully and behind the threshold of the khata, the big iron gate, two little sisters, Bobby and Dolly, go about their lives. The scene, the scene seems like it's from hundreds of years ago, but it is actually dated back to the 1956. It's one of my earliest memories in which I am almost four years old. It's the street I remember the most, the street on which I lived. A little girl darts out of her house crying, I want to go to my mama. Come back, shouts my Sati, my nanny, from inside the big gate. No, I want to go to my mama. Your mama has gone to the cinema. You get in here at once. I will also go to the cinema, she retorts, and runs down the street. Suddenly, something stirs in the air. There's a snuffled grunt in the sky, and the breeze changes. The sky turns red. Tin sheds begin to flap and rattle. The smell of wind on earth. It's a dust storm. Stray pieces of paper littering the ground outside the bookbinder's shop fly up and float in the air. Bicycles fall in a slow, studied motion along the wall of the cinema hall. The wooden shutter of Yarn Halvai's shop tills and slips out of its clamp. He stands with his arms outstretched, holding it with all his Malai Dasi strength against the wind, his lungi threatening to fly out. A rickshaw puller pedals backwards and sideways. The world seems to slant at the edges. Dust storms the streets. My Sarpi's voice cuts through the mayhem. Stop, I say. Get back, girl. It's stop. The girl is not coming back. She runs all the way to the end of the street and suddenly finds herself in the middle of Katra Sheikh Singh Chow, in front of Regent Tokis, surrounded by huge cinema posters. The posters begin to tear from the whiplash of the wind. Sir, 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 sir. Faces of actors and actresses fold up and slap against the dry, whitewash of the decrepit cinema hall. 
unable to keep her eyes open from the dust, wind and tears, the little girl hides her face in her sleeve. At her feet, swirl particles of dust, torn scraps of paper, bright orange and pink trimmings from the tailor's shop, and gather momentum. She stands still for a while, watching the little merry go round around her dotted rubber booties until her eyes fall upon something. Across the street, the plot waller is doing a thunder. He is a skinny man who sells little leaflets with the plot and songs of Hindi films printed on them. A strong gust whisks away the sepia-colored leaflets from his hands and flings them into the wind. They soar in the air, going up and up in circles, dodging the poor man's attempts to retrieve them. Tossed into the wind, the yellow sheet somersaults, now diving to his feet, now rising as if to sudden applause. He leaps and plunges by the side of the road, slapping his arms around, hurling himself as the musical notes. One leaf slips into two and two into four till the song dance about his gaunt, lanky frame. He dances with the songs, the poor plot father, trying in vain to hang on to his only means of livelihood as it slips away into the grimy air. No one notices the little girl as she stands in the middle of the chalk, enthralled by the dance of songs. Her large eyes fill with tears, but she forgets to cry. There you are, Marjan. My Sadi steps forward, scoops me up in one sweeping movement, lodges me onto her hip, strides down the street, and puts me back inside the house where I belong. As we enter, my grandmother rises from her chair, pointing a finger at me. No little girls from good homes ever go out to the cinemas on the street. Now we would like to know that how did you, or maybe the story told to you, how did you, or what was that night? We always know about Krishna's night of birth. You know. So what was that night? Please read it out to us. Stormy night, it is. Hi everyone, lovely to have you all here. <laughs> Thanks, this is the night I was born. It was during the winter rains that I arrived. I was born on 3 February 1952 at the VJ Queen Victoria Jubilee Hospital located at one end of Company Bath in Amritsar. It was a very disturbed, stormy night, recalls my mama. The night you were born, it rained incessantly. I was lying in a little corner room of the hospital with you, a tiny bundle next to me on the cot. The room was filled with water. It leaked everywhere. A cold wind blew in from the slit in the window. There was a furnace in the room, but no one was around to light the firewood. The long, sprawling corridors of the old Victorian red brick structure lay empty in the thrashing downpour. Dr. Santram Dhal, the doctor who delivered me, had wound up and left for the day. My Sardi, who managed the house and would later be my nanny, had dropped off the tiffin and returned home. So had my father, after his evening visit. The ward was dim and deserted. In the wee hours of the morning, while it was still dark, a sadhu baba came knocking on my door, said mama. But I was too weak to get up from my bed. If I did, I'd have to wade through the ice-cold, waterlogged room to get to the door. The sadhu kept knocking for a long time, begging, but I could not help him. Finally, he left, cursing. What was the curse, Mama? I would ask whenever she'd tell me this story. 
I don't remember Bita, she would say. He cursed me, not you, my doll. The night I was born continues to fascinate me with all its dramatic elements, the freezing cold, the dimly lit corridors, the deserted ward, the deluge, the ominous sadhu and his curse. Thank you. God, you know, I don't know if sometimes they say curse is a blessing, so maybe some kind of, uh, because we have lots of gods and goddesses stories where eventually the curse is working in your favor. In some other, your avatar on earth, maybe not this channel, the other channel. So I think uh, it has worked for you. With growing, we always, when we grow up, we really don't know, like, what are the feelings which we get, you know. We don't know, we, maybe because we know something get hurt, we say we are hurt, you know, it's pain, it's bleeding. But the inner hurt, we really don't know what is it called. And is it your own hurt or it hurts? happens because of we see somebody experiencing it. There's a fantastic, a small incident. She can call it a story. Please read, if you can, page number four. We will discuss, but I just feel that before you read the book, you must know more about it since we are here. Otherwise, we always discuss, interview, questions, answers. We keep on doing all that. That we can Google it as well. So let's be here. Because book launch is supposed to be book launch. That's what I understand. I haven't written a book yet. My first proper childhood memory has to do with a boy with a bowl. One evening, Mama, along with other women, had gone to a house in the neighborhood to distribute milk to needy children. I decided to tag along to do my first bit of social work. I was little then and clung to the pallu of my mother's sari as she went about her mission of mercy. The little boy with the dark complexion was even little, littler. Just as the ladies finished distributing milk, and were about to climb down, he appeared at the bottom of the narrow staircase, a small bowl in his hand, looking up expectantly. Oh no, there's no milk left, bachche. It's all finished. The boy just stood there looking up at us, his eyes <clears throat> large and luminous in his dark face, dressed only in a dirty banyan, the rest of his skinny body as naked as the day he was born. Why have you come so late, my child? Mama asked again, feeling sorry for the little one. My, my mother, he began breathlessly, panting from the effort of climbing the three steps to get inside the building. My mother did not have a katori. She had to borrow it. His eyes shone with pale anticipation. But the milk has just finished Mama repeated, holding on to my hand. The small dark face grew darker. In that moment, at age four, I experienced a hollow feeling in my stomach as I stood looking at this tiny human being who seemed not more than two years old. In this image would remain with me for a long time to come. It was the first time I felt empathy for someone. I remember recognizing this as a new emotion. While feeling sorry for him, I was watching myself, watching the boy and feeling his pain. This perhaps was the first lesson in acting, taking a mental note of an experience and storing it away. In my later years, I would draw upon <coughs> this emotion and use it in many ways. Sitting at a roadside cafe, 
on 33rd Street and Lexington Avenue, he'd suddenly appear before me, the boy with the bowl. Sometimes I was looking at life from the top of the staircase, and at other times, I was the little boy with the small dark face with large luminous eyes standing at the bottom of the stairs with an empty bowl in my hand. Thank you. From the beginning, I was taught to call my sister Didi, making her sound like she was much older, though the age difference between us is precisely a year and ten months. Her real name is Smithy, which in Sanskrit means smile. She had the most beautiful smile on earth, and each time she smiled, her eyes lit up like lamps. I liked to think I had a great smile too. The difference was that she was oblivious of it, while I knew exactly the effect I had on people, having practiced a variety, <laughs> variety of poses in front of the mirror and the hat stand. As a girl, Didi was God's good child. In our early, chi in our early childhood pictures, I see the difference between the two of us clearly. She is the all-smiling, trusting, innocent face of humanity. And me, I have this, guess what I'm up to now? Look in my eyes. Actually, I was at a great advantage. Didi being older was the one answerable for everything, whereas I was accountable for nothing. She was the one who got reprimanded for every wrong we committed. With that innocent face of yours, you can get away with murder. She grumbled when she got annoyed with me. Mama would dress us in identical frocks, making sure we looked like sisters. During our early school days, Didi rode a bicycle with me happily perched on the back seat as she trundled all the way to school from Hall Bazaar to Majitha Road and back. But she never really resented that. I knew Didi had a soft heart for me. In my favorite photograph of the two of us, we are in a tiny little tricycle going round and round in the villa. When I was small, I was a total chamchi of my sister, trying to do exactly as she said and did. Perhaps this was why, for much of our childhood, she treated me as if I was completely stupid. You don't know anything, was a standard remark for me, and I was, and it was I and no one but I who was responsible for creating this image of myself. Every time she wanted a break from learning her lessons and felt like a little entertainment, she would summon me. Dipi, chal, chuchi banja. Dipi, come on, now become stupid. <laughs> and I would instantly transform, become a chuchi, start babbling in totally zaban, turning all my R's and D's into L's, twisting the corner of my frock around my little finger, narrating some fictitious story. I, I went <laughs> Didi would enjoy this act of mine for a few minutes and have a hearty laugh, but once she'd had enough of me, she'd suddenly come on. Acha bas, hum theek ho Okay, enough, now you become all right. And instantly I'd straighten up, become completely normal, at once disconnecting myself from this desperate creature of a minute ago. Both of us would quickly return to our books, me to my impossible math, and Didi to her geography lessons. As a performer, I believe these were my beginnings. I all enjoy listening. You know, it's always easy. You don't know where to stop, where to begin, where to just keep chatting. But I know one thing, I told her, it's very difficult that you, you eventually figure out which is the right medium for you to express your being. Maybe at some age you do manage. And maybe, you know, there's a small, uh, there was a, this documentary which I saw. It was about a renowned filmmaker, Tarkovsky, and his whole point was, was trying to find a medium to express his being, and he found Sam. So, 
when I read her book. I felt because she is a screenplay writer, she makes films, she's made a film, she's acted. But I just feel maybe after reading the book, I just feel this is it. There's a wonderful poem in Hindi. I'd like to say a couple of it. बाकी कविता शब्दों से नहीं लिखी जाती बाकी कविता शब्दों से नहीं लिखी जाती पूरे अस्तित्व को खींच कर एक वीरान की तरफ नहीं छोड़ दी जाती सो देर कम्स द टाइम वेन यू लिव एंड यू गेट द इनर कॉलिंग टू एक्सप्रेस शी पेंटिंग इज अ वंडरफुल मेमोरी वेर ऑल ऑफ अ सडन वी नो शी वॉज अ पेंट I would love it if she reads Blue Frog. Correct? Fiasco. It's it's the yeah. Correct? No. One forty three. Blue Frog of Diwali. But it's a fiasco. But must. You know, there's that one line which just all of a sudden I remember this film called Loving Vincent, which is you know Van Gogh and. The hundred painters. It's a painting animation, and all of a sudden we feel that happened with that one line. I'd say, when she is. So I think this is her calling, right? Now. Yeah. Here in this chapter, I've been um, I've been describing. The Shera and how kids, you know, you go and how Diwali was celebrated at home. We had this mochi mohalla in the back of the house. The house was adjacent to the mosque, and our on, on the terrace where we slept every night for 19, the first 19 years of my life, we could it was we could you know it was overlooking the mosque. You know, so there is this between the mosque and the house is this gully. And the Mochi Mohalla, the cobblers, uh, who were refugees from Rajasthan, they had come and settled here. One Diwali night was particularly eventful. I would later remember it as the Blue Frock Fiasco. I must have been about seven years old then. In preparation for Diwali that year, Mama had cut out from Women and Home a beautiful picture of two little white girls wearing identical frocks. The frocks were a rich, deep blue with gathers at the waist. Dainty white lace frills hung off the edges of the collars and sleeves. Mama wanted the exact same blue frock stitched for Didi and me for this Diwali. She had a very fine piece of white muslin lying in the wooden almira, which she decided to get dyed a brilliant blue. The muslin was pulled out from the cupboard one afternoon and taken to the rangwala. Who dyed the same blue? Mama carried the magazine with her to show Color Singh. I would call him in my mind. I would call him Color Singh. Color Singh to show Color Singh what exactly she desired. As blue as this, she told him. Nothing less. It's called Prussian blue. Now my mother was a painter, so these the color tones will keep coming up in the book. It's called Prussian blue. Yes, yes, he assured her. Then the old sadar tailor from across the house was called in. I want the exact same pattern, she said, placing the magazine in front of him. The old man got down to work immediately. Diwali being just a day away. The day of Diwali, I was very excited. Every now and then, I'd run to the thada to check if the frocks were ready. Day turned to evening, and evening came to be night. But this Diwali night, the frocks did not get stitched on time. Though the darsi stayed up till late working on them, little blue strips scattered all around him. Both Didi and I waited. I remember we didn't light up at our house that year. We simply waited on the thara for the tailor to finish sewing on the hooks and buttons 
and hemming the sleeves and collars so that we could get to wear our new frocks before the night was over. I walked up to the terrace and leaned over the edge looking down at the mochi dwellings. How beautiful their homes appeared, lit with oil lamps, the sound of their nightly dholak more rigorous, the singing more intense. The mud houses glowed with freshly coated walls and the white powder motifs painted on the thresholds and around windows. The scene looked like it was out of a picture book. Yes, despite the lamps and the rangoli and the music, yet despite the lamps and the rangoli and the music, there was something sad about this Diwali night. On our terrace, we had not lit the candles. As the night wore on, the festivity around us began to fade. The firecrackers that had lit up the sky a while ago, creating a fantastic backdrop for the white minarets of the mosque, had dwindled to a handful of flashes here and there. Children around the neighborhood had finished bursting the last of their, of their crackers for the night and were now going back inside their homes. This was the quietest Diwali for us girls. The thunder of explosions and dazzle of lights had died down. Only one yellow bulb still glowed. The old Sardar Darzi, sitting in his wooden, on his wooden stool, working away in his modest establishment, giving the finishing touches to our frocks by hand. His was the last shop still open in the gully. Both Didi and I were quiet. Mama stood with the thara with us, sharing our disappointment. All the iron and wooden shutters of shops of, on our street had cl clanged shut, a finale to the Diwali night. We came back inside the house, time now to change in our pajamas and get into bed. This Diwali night was gone forever from our lives, uncelebrated. Suddenly, there was a knock on the paddock. Without pausing to think, I ran to open the main gate. I perched on my toes to push up the iron latch so the small gate could be released open. In my heart, I knew whoever was knocking on our door at this hour could only be God sent. Sure enough, there he was, the old Sardar Darsi, standing in the dark, his face frayed with tilted, frayed and tilted to one side, both his arms stretched out. My eyes lit up at what I saw. Our very own Messiah, his grey beard and white turban glowing in the light of the street lamp. The Saviour himself. In his hands he held two hangers on which hung frocks of the most brilliant blue I'd ever seen. The old tailor's face had a faint smile of regret and benediction at the same time. I looked at the frocks and then at him. Didi came up behind me. There we were, two little girls, misty-eyed, gaping at the old man who stood Jesus-like, blue color dripping from his palms. Mama quickly changed us back from pajamas into our new blue frocks. That Diwali night, we were the last two girls up on a terrace, lighting firecrackers, invoking the cords, illuminating the dark skies. Thank you. imaginary world, which means that there is this real world, so we don't know exactly what is real and it's nothing to do with being spiritual about it, that life is one mitya, we are not talking about that, we are just talking about real, what is real happening in front of you. So please. I think every child has an imaginary world. We, we all here at least must have had an inner world and we live there. 
And you know, we tried there. And, it's and so you created one character within you. When they <laughs> okay. So you had created an imaginary child within you. And uh, what was it like? I mean, you, you. When was that first, which occurred to you? When did this world start? I don't exactly remember that, but I, I because I was, I used to live in my inner world so much that I didn't quite at that time understand it as being so different from each other. It wasn't like that. I don't remember at what age. I remember when Mama used to narrate her Burma stories. I would always kind of um, extend that narration and direct it back towards me. Like as if it's my experience and I'm part of Mama's narration, I would plant myself into it. You know, in Mandalay, we, used to, we had this beautiful moat around the Mandalay Palace. Our house was just across the street and we could see, you know, young boys and girls uh, strumming the instrument and, you know, boating in the moat. I was always there in the moat, <laughs> you know? this, which is, I think, normal for everyone, right? Um, and, and I also would encounter my mother. I would encounter my mother. In one encounter, I, I see my mother, she was very beautiful, right? She, I, I would see her, I, I would see her wearing a lumi and a Burmese, uh, you know, uh, NG, they wear. Huh? And uh, her hair is long and she's walking down and I, I, I go up to her in my booties uh, and my little frock. And I'm, she says, there, uh, oh, I give her a lily hmm? and she takes it and then she's, no, sorry, she's carrying the lilies in her hand. And she gives one to me. And then when she looks at me, she says, where did you get those eyes? And I say, from you. <laughs> and it's, it's, it may sound a bit spooky, but to me it was the most natural thing to imagine that my mama, very imagination, my mama is asking, where did you get those eyes? And I say, from you. And she, she gets a bit confused and then she, she walks away and I keep looking at her. You know why I, why I ask this? It's beautiful because there is a character called Bay and she would call it Baby. And how is that story? Because Bay dies and Bay dies, there is a very mystery to it that she's an old lady who falls from... Yeah, Bay was, was a real person who lived at the end of uh, the street on the right corner beyond the mosque uh, and the tabela. Uh, she was up on, a, I think, the second, second floor. But in my imagination, I had made her, you know, sit up on my, in my house, the fourth terrace of our house at the absolute corner. So, uh, what is So, uh, I would like to, I want you to first tell what, how, what the whole, so that you don't have to read yeah. uh, where, I mean, she died, that yeah. she is, whatever that death. And yeah, that's so the hard cut thing, a little bit. Uh, yeah. that, so that, what was the reason? You know? Bay had, Bay, Bay was, uh, I, I think she was a prominent character on that street. And uh, she was a very proud, small woman. So when, when, I, uh, when I plant her, and I call, I call her Baby, she's now another character. She's, she's taken from Bay, but she's gone beyond that. And she sits on the edge of the of this huge house, and she keeps watch over what's going on in the world, the mochi mahalla, the, the buffalo shed, the dukandar niche ke sab, and people you know bicycles passing and going people coming. In. So um, I imagine that uh, she's keeping tap on, you know, everything is okay there, right, you know. So I, in my imagination, they. Baby, baby was in my imagination. When the when the real woman, the, when they died, um, there was uh, there was some rumors about how she died, uh, how she fell. Uh, she had a grandson who was very brilliant, Sardar boy. Uh, he came first in Punjab University. Something like that happened, and she went all over the all over the mahalla, you know, boasting about her grandchild. 
And then he, uh, when, when Muni, Muni was his boy, when he came back home, they had a fight. He said, why are you going around your, your uh, you know, telling, telling Sudhakar? Sudhakar ko aap bolo ki, look at my grandson, you have been four years in the same class, and my grandson, first class, first in Punjab. So they, grandmother and grandson, they had this fight. That's all we know about. And then in the night, it was uh, drizzling, it was raining, we were sitting on the terrace and slowly in the wee hours of the morning, windows start opening up. And we heard Raj Auntie upstairs, our tenants, she says, Beji, big pain, means fallen, accident. And then, I mean, uh, details filtered in, but in, uh, in, we, in my mind. Yeah, I will. I will uh, this yeah. So this imaginary part only I'm going to read. Um, in my mind, baby's death happened a little differently. Baby fell like gossamer, not a sound, just a faint, far echo. A muffled blob of old flesh and bones made a low thud, slowly, lightly, floating down like a white chiffon dupatta that slips off the clothesline. Feather like she fell in the empty street, wet from a night of rain. Tossed onto the ground, her brittle bones in a sack of old shriveled flesh created a silent splash as the jute doll thudded, bounced lightly and then lay still, forever. Had baby fallen from the rooftop and died in pain, or had she met her end peacefully in her sleep? I got up and looked over the edge. Nothing there. Baby must be fast asleep or in a delivery. I knocked on her door. No answer. I banged again on that creaky wooden door when finally, with my pushing it slightly, something inside clicked and the bolt slipped open. Slowly I entered the room and called for her. Baby, I whispered. Baby was lying among her chandeliers, still and without life, wrapped in her pink and orange pulkari, and her eyes were open forever. Who was baby in my mind? I, I failed to analyze. In many ways, baby is me, the writer, looking back at life, living in her inner world, keeping vigil over memories. Many years later, when I woke up in the middle of the night and walked across the Barsati in the drizzle, I saw her. There, standing at the edge of the rooftop, was a figure of a young woman clad in pale pink pulkari. I stood gazing. Baby, I whispered. Baby slowly turned her radiant face towards me and smiled. The night drizzled on. Thank you. I think you should speak more. But <laughs> the point is, uh, this baby got created then. You know, it's a, we, we cannot express, as we always say, the children can't express. Just don't tell them any, anything. Don't tell them about. I remember as a child, when my grandmother died, I was not allowed to go to the crematorium because I was too small. Mm -hmm. Because I wouldn't be able to take pain. And uh, well, I came to know much later what his death is all about. And there, when I read this book, she has a very, very important chapter about Sunny's death. Sunny. And I don't know whether she should read, but at least she should speak about it. And uh, her imagination and maybe being a filmmaker as well, how she's managed to really just suppose pain to painlessness. I think you should be able to maybe yeah, speak I can't, about it. Uh, I, can't, I, mean, I can't tell about it. Anyway, it's, it's about, it comes from, I'll tell you, uh, the chapter is called Crack in the... Crack in the Picture Perfect. Picture Perfect Frame. So it's about how your life is picture perfect 
and yet there is a crack. Yeah, there is. Uh, there was this. There have been memories, a few of them, of my parents' uh, discord between them. My parents uh, decided to move away from each other at a very late age in their life, almost in their seventies. But I, as a child, had seen. I remember a few instances. So uh, I have talked in the book about that and how it impacted me and how it never really uh, let me feel completely secure in any one relationship, thinking always that everything that seems perfect is going to end. Na? So uh, that kind of psychological um, effect or damage had been done, you know, I guess, uh, since childhood. But in this, uh, then I also speak about my mother, between me and my younger brother, there were three offspring <coughs> that she gave birth to and she lost all three. There was something, some defect at birth that would happen and only one, uh, one child, a boy, survived for about eight months. Um, but after eight months, he did come home, otherwise mama was always, uh, I remember going, coming back from the hospital empty-handed. Uh, this boy, this uh, boy, Sunny, uh, because he was with her for eight months, so she could never really get over Sunny's death. She kept, till the end of her life, she kept narrating how Sunny passed away, how Sunny died in her arms, how he kept looking up at her face as if asking, Mama, can't you help me? Can't you save me? And she would keep repeating that. and. I would try to, she later, of course, she was suffering from Alzheimer's and dementia. So I would, uh, you know, I would dissuade her from uh, going back into those memories, which were really painful for her. But I, in my chapter, I don't look at Sunny's death as such a uh, monumental tragedy because he, the, the baby could not, he lived for eight months, but for those eight months, I call them eight months of breathlessness, he could not breathe properly. He couldn't breathe. So that little thing, either I will do that. That will be the last reading. You know? Then we can all chat. From this, I've talked about how Mama narrates Sunny's death. And then I say, from this point in the narrative, every time I try to recreate Sunny's death in my mind, I have somehow only been able to see it from the other side. It was 6.30 in the evening when Sunny's eyes finally closed to the world, his little soul rising, rising above the shadowy pillars of the veranda, above the blue-green painted windows of the green room, above the open-to-the-sky fireplace on the first terrace. Lightly it moved beyond the Barsati, passing by the tin shed, wafting feather-like around the white dome of the mosque, its four minarets and beyond. Higher, higher above the gali, the Mochi Mohalla, where he could see the walled city speckled with lights, the sky, <coughs> the sky engulfing it, the wet, the wet earth below turning to a mere shimmer. Sunny could see it all now with clarity. His mother and father turned into little specks on earth. Eight months of breathlessness, eight months of a beautiful woman's warm bosom to bury his tiny face into, all sensations he carries now through the enormous sky. It was a night of shifting shadows, a back flew low between the cow shed and the veranda. Mama touched her son's body. It was cold. The fever was gone. Life was gone out of him. The pain had ended. His face now appeared peaceful, calm. Sunny felt lifted. Swept through a white fog, its cool, cool tingling. The wetness of the white poultice across his forehead no longer made him cry. He loved it, this new feeling of being tossed and thrown on this white foam. He danced about in the clouds, skidding on the un unreal whiteness, of a white mist that soothed and tingled him, 
a breeze that drove the pores of his bodiless being wide open. The winds swept him sideways and upside down, drowning him in, in this blinding whiteness, and he giggled. And a soundless ripple ran through the clouds, and then he was swept beyond. Beyond even the clouds, he now saw a pitch black expanse studded with bright sparkles of light. He was enchanted by the radiance, and he wanted it. He so wanted it. These were the very stars he had seen. From the veranda, looking up from his mother's arms, he'd seen these tiny flickering lights in the sky, a sky endlessly fascinating, that had been far, far from his reach. But now, it was here, so, so near to him, just fingertips away. It was all around him as he was being swept away towards the brilliance. Beneath him, a woman's heart-wrenching wail echoed in the universe. Mama stood in the veda of the house, a shriek trapped within her, a shriek only her son could hear, and he looked back, smiling. Don't cry for me, Mama. I'm happy now. Look, the pain is gone. I'm happy. Then her legs gave way. She buried her face in her son's cold, still body and sank to the floor. Sunny laughed. By now he had moved beyond. He had become part of the glow in the sky, was one with the brilliance, leaving behind on his, on his last journey the echo of a woman who had been for eight good months his mother on earth. I also imagine an evening Days after Sunny's death, I'm sitting in one end of the Veda, and Mama's on the swing, gently swaying. A bat flies low in the dimly lit house shed, but Mama remains unmoved by it. She's softly singing under her breath. She used to sing this lullaby to us all the time. Hush by baby on the treetop, when the wind blows to cradle the rock. And now she's singing Hush by baby up in the sky. Up in the sky, on a soft cloud, it's easy to fly. When the clouds burst, the raindrops will fall, and down will come baby to mother once more. Outside in the empty street, little boys in red, dressed as langurs, pass by, beating on drums. Thank you, that's a thing. Only, only reading is over. That's the only thing. If you want to ask, but there, is, there is a little a reference of Lagoons, I will tell you, in Punjab, when Jabkui Beta Ni Hota Kisi Ghar Mein, and the couple makes a mannat, ki hamari yaan beta bhi peda ho, to jo pehla beta peda hota hai, usko Hanuman ji ki forge, sena mein bharti kar dhe, like the little toddlers are dressed in red and silver and gold and all over crowns and, and beating on drums, pooch bhi hoti hai. Beating on drums in the kitchen. This pile of little, you know, boys dressed in red, they just are walking down in the street, and I just imagine that they are passing by, but they are the first born, and Sunny was the first born, the son, uh, the boy in the family. So, uh, that. so uh, the book has been quite cathartic actually, the writing of it, uh, as much as it has been exhilarating and, uh, you know, putting down of memories. At the same time, it's been like uh, quite, a, quite an experience, huh? because you go through not only your own pain, you go through the pain of your parents, you go through the pain of the community, you go through the pain of the country, you know, this whole partition, and being uh, Amritsar, being a town right across the border from, you know, you know border from uh, Lahore, both parents having studied in Lahore, coming back across here forever, seeing Lahore to Lahore, you see, you know, that kind of thing, and that whole nostalgia. And there was so much, I mean, I can't start talking. Let's just have a chat with all of you and, and just run. Anything you might want to? How do you have such a vivid recollection? When I think of my past, I think of uh, a blur, a blur of. Uh, happiness or something, but I don't remember it in such 
How do you remember it? I think it's only my childhood that I remember in such, such detail. Only my childhood because it was such a splendid time and I was, I, you know, I had this uh, such clear memory and I also have been writing down these memories for a very long time. It's not just now, so everything is coming back. It's not coming back now. It has been coming back from a very long time and I have been making notes and I've been writing little scenes that I remember. You know, scenes from my childhood. No, they're not the one I burned. <laughs> Which hardly had anything, but you know, if I were to ask you who you are, what would your answer be? Uh, I, I just like to think of myself as a creative soul who just is com compelled to express herself any which way, whichever medium is given to me. I mean, if I think if I had maybe done another 150 to 200 more films, maybe I wouldn't have had this urge to express myself so much but because my because I was a little picky and, and a little kind of I wouldn't say over ambitious little laid back. I don't think it was laid back. I don't like that word. But I was always uh, wanting to express myself creatively. So either Joby Hart Mechis I ever grow head to Smith, Punitara say painting at Bukarna and writing is I think the closest to my heart, it's closest to who I am as a person. I mean, people love to call me Miss Champo and all other names, uh, which is fine. I mean, I owe a lot to uh, Sai Paranjpe for having created that wonderful character. But what I'm saying is that that's not me. The only, the only me is what you heard me read. And, and the book and my poetry is the only autobiography that I am, I have been writing, but it has not been. But you know, in, in the film industry, it is believed that unless your focus is totally on films, anything else that you do, I think theatre is something that is acceptable, it's, it's, but anything else that you do is considered, considered a kind of diversion. And it seems as if me is a bill puri tarah se acting mein hai, ye to chali jaati hai, spiti mein ghumti hai, painting karti hai, gana gaati hai, iske baare mein. Because they are not able to put you in a box, they don't know how to deal with you. Yeah. But have you had to struggle with that, or or do you just go with the flow? I think that yeah, I've been depressed about that. That they they don't really care to know who I am. दो तीन अच्छे सक्सेसफुल रोल से वो छाप जो है वो वो लगा देते हैं वित्ति नगर स्पेस तो मिस स्वेंसो नेहा ऑफिसर साधी ऑफ दैट फिल्म एंड ऑल दैट एंड देन इट्स वेरी कन्वेंट सो बट आल्सो दैट इज़ व्हाट सिनेमा डज मैं यू आई मीन व्हाट एवर इमेज व्हिच यू बीन एबल टू पोर्ट्रेट सक्सेसफुली � तो उनको लगता है अब यही बस अच्छा कर सकती ये इसी लिए सूटेबल है हम जो many of us agree with this here but writing is closest to me when I was in school I was writing Kiran Bedi was my senior in school and एक दिन मैंने एक poem लिखी बारिश के ऊपर उसमें एक सिली सी line थी पानी भागा भागा आए और इस तरह stupid line but I ran to my sister she was standing in the shed you know cycle shed पे I ran to दीदी I have written a poem in class today so Kiran Devi was standing right behind her. She said, oh, you write poems, Nikki, come on, let's see. What it is, read, read. So I was like, read, come on, read, come on, read, come on, read, come on, read, come on. And she said, she read the line, not a, nothing on her face, I couldn't tell her what she was feeling. I was very embarrassed, but she said, keep writing. With every poem you write, you will be closer to who you are, and you will be writing better and better and better. I, I think writing came to me first. I think bad note. Of course, you see rehearsals, Didi ke saath kaafi ho chuki. Switch off, switch off it, na na? Chuchi ban jaya, thik ho jaya, chuchi ban jaya, na na? So, yeah, I think for me the process of this create, the creative process, which is internal, 
has been so important. Uh, uh, I haven't really given it much thought. कि अब मैं कैसे कर रही हूँ मैं पेंटिंग क्यों कर रही हूँ अब मैं क्यों जा रही हूँ वहाँ पे क्या वहाँ क्या है मेरा कुछ कोई रोल मिस हो जाएगा आई वॉज नेवर दैट आई वॉज नेवर इनसिक्योर अबाउट कि कोई रोल हुए होंगे बहुत से रोल्स मिस हुए होंगे बिकॉज आई वॉज आई वॉन्टेड टू ट्रैक आई वॉन्टेड टू वॉक विद माई सेल्फ आई आई डिट दैट मेनी ईयर्स माउंटेन्स या I was stupid enough, you know, when I was 13. This is the last chapter. I did not want to write about this. I was 13, and I, I ran away from home because I wanted to see Kashmir. And I was like, I mean, in the film, I had seen so much. 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 स्पेस कॉल कश्मीर वो डल लेक में शिकारे चिनार आरजू ये वो सब एक दिमाग खराब हो चुका था सो वे आई जस्ट डिसाइडेड आई वॉन्ट टू बी इन कश्मीर आई डोट वॉन्ट लिव इन दिस वेरी मोहल्ला ये हो गया बहुत अब मैं कश्मीर में रहूँगी सो आई जस्ट टू ट्रेन बट एट पठान आई वॉज गोइंग टू टेक अ बस फ्रॉम पठानकोट से आगे जम्मू जम्मू से आगे बस जाती है श्रीनगर इतना तो मालूम था बिकॉज स्कूल में फ्रेंड्स थी जो जिनकी फैमिलीज उनको गर्मी की छुट्टियों में कश्मीर लेके जाते थे बट माई पेरेंट्स यू शो ऑल गो टू कुल्लू मनाए बट आई न्यू हाउ टू गेट टू कश्मीर सो आई आई बॉडी दिस ट्रेन टू पठानकोट तो वहीं पे फिर दे कॉट मी तो जब वापस आई तो पिटाई हुई नहीं तो नहीं हुई तो हुई कि जब वापस आई तो पिताजी एक थप्पड़ पड़ा था खाली पुलिस जो थी वहाँ पे जो पुलिस इंस्पेक्टर जो थे वहाँ प्लेटफॉर्म के रात को इट वॉज अ डिजर्टेड प्लेटफॉर्म नथिंग वे थोड़े से कुछ लोग ऐसे सो रहे हैं पोटियाँ के ऊपर सर रख के और पुलिस हाँ विंटर था जनवरी में कोट वोट ऊपर से पहना हुआ था पर अंदर से बॉटल ग्रीन ब्लेजर सेकेंड हार्ट कॉन्वेंट रिटर्न हो गए and uh, then they put me in the ladies waiting room and uh, they kept me there so uh, the whole night i stayed there in the morning of course my parents were informed immediately they had written it on amritsar se pathankot pahunch jate to jab tak unhone dhoonda notice kiya ki mummy ke ghar mein bhi nahi hai raj aunty ke ghar mein bhi nahi hai kahan mein kya hua tab tak main pathankot pahunch gayi thi so then when i was got back my father just I mean, my mother was devastated. I, when I saw her, I, I was very, very under, very angry. When I saw Mama, uh, she was lying. She couldn't even get up. She was so enervated and so done. You know, um, she had, I think, imagined the worst happening to me. So my father, then after I lay down with my mother for some time, you know, once she got her, her jaan me jaan, just like that. Then my father, you know, took me and made me sit in his uh, across his study desk in his study, and he asked me what happened, and I told him exactly what had happened, and how I had bought the ticket, how I went there, what my plan was, how I had to be jeopardized, how I had to be hard to get in. So he said, "Ki beta, in one night, you whatever I I worked so hard to, you have destroyed in one night." What took me years to earn as reputation, as we call it. Um, that's all. And then after that, after that, uh, I saw him. There were uh, there were other uh, neighbors, you know, Phatik Pe, Varanda Me, Veda Me. All of them were together. And now, Professor Sab, she's okay. Everything is okay. Yes, everything is okay. Yes, everything is okay. And he's showing them now. कॉमिक बुक्स होती है ना स्कूल गर्ल कॉमिक्स जो हम लोग स्कूल में पढ़ते थे द साइलेंट थ्री द एडवेंचरस फोर इट वॉज ऑल अबाउट स्कूल गर्ल्स गोइंग आउट ऑन मेजर एडवेंचर ट्रिप्स तो पिताजी शोइंग एम ऑल दिस की देखो ये इन्फ्लुएंस तो होता ही है टीन एज हो गया तो ये इन्फ्लुएंस ये सारी इन चीज़ों का असर होता है क्या करें सो होपफुली आफ्टर दैट यू रन अवे ओनली इन इमेजिनेशन बाद में तो रनिंग हुई तो माउंटेन्स वॉज धड़ल्ले से 
के शूटिंग कैंसिल हुई चलो एक तो इंडियन एयरलाइंस फ्लाइट टू दिल्ली दिल्ली से सीधा बस स्टॉप बस स्टॉप पे सीधा टिकट काउंटर पे हाँ जी दे दो कुल्लू की टिकट हो तो जी कुल्लू की बस नहीं लगी कहाँ की लगी बलाजी की तो बलाजी की बिल्कुल एंड इज ऑलवेज ए पी डब्ल्यू डी है वहाँ पे जाके आप है जाओ ये वो तो आपको सराहकों पे और वो बहुत ही बहुत खूबसूरत वो ही जगह है कि लेडीज़ फ्रॉम रूम चाह बाहर निकली थी इस स्नीक टाउन और वहाँ पर एक गुड्डा जो बैठा हुआ था बारिश हो रही थी उससे डरे नहीं और उससे जो बात हुई वो बता दो वो बहुत ही खूबसूरत छह सात लाइनें हैं ऑल ऑफ़ असल शी फेल कंफर्टेबल विद दिस ओल्ड मैन एंड वो वो फॉल्स में क्यों नहीं जा पाया वो उससे बता रहा है कि बुढ़ा आदमी बता रहा है इनको छोटी बच्ची है जो भूल गया मैं क्या पढ़ रहा हूँ नहीं यार नहीं तू बता अरे यार तुम्हारे क्या नहीं हाँ अच्छा ऑडियंस कुछ या लेट्स लेट्स चैट या सर शुड वी ओपन द फ्लोर फॉर ऑडियंस क्वेश्च I have been asked to कि इसका sequel तो आप दिखेंगे ना film and all that तो मुझे इतना नहीं याद This is what I was going to ask you I am sufficient for that and the first the first thing which came to my mind after reading the cover page of this book a country called childhood this 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 title is quite intriguing and exciting as well yes and this caught my attention. But that put me to another thought. Will there be uh, any other book? Maybe a country called adulthood? Or maybe a continent <laughs> called adulthood? What do you say? I don't think so. I don't think so because I... See, childhood is something that I've... I've... You know, really... Just working like a treasure. You know, I really sort of... Uh, enjoyed writing about it. It's like such a, I mean, such precious memories are there, and because unko dimag mein nature kiya hai over the years, and you know, always gone back to it, and so much uh, living with it, that it just came so naturally to 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 just recapture everything and put it down on paper. But uske aage ka jo hai sakar wo phir. I mean, I have to do a lot more. I mean, I didn't want to write a regular autobiography, because of the fact that I didn't want to write a regular autobiography. 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 With that kind of a book, I think वो तो तो पता ही है सबको कैसे फिल्में हुई और क्या हुआ और बाकी सब तो मतलब ज़िंदगी के मसले होते ही हैं जो I just wanted to share this part of my life because I thought this was splendid. Yeah, पहले चार चार पर बीस साल पहले की लिखी है. Yeah, and then after that. The process of editing is that a painful oh, one. one. <laughs> you know, I'll tell you a very interesting it's thing about John Schlesinger, with whom I was once working. And uh, he said, editing to me is the most painful thing that I can do. So I edit a scene out. Yeah. And then for Two days I toss and turn and I say, but if I don't have that scene, the rest of it won't make any sense at all. So I end up adding two scenes <laughs> instead of editing it. So that yes. process I find very, very interesting. What did you do yes. with that? See, I, I just uh, took all this material, this flood of memories to my publisher. To say, he didn't come, he didn't come, and he made a concise. इसके आधे साइज़ की किताब जो कि ही थॉट इट विल बी परफेक्ट यू नो बिकॉज़ इट जस्ट टू द द द द क्रीम आउट एंड आई सेड नहीं पर अगर वो व्हेन द बुक केम बैक टू मी आफ्टर हिज एडिट व्हेन आई कॉल्ड हिम सेड इट बट इफ आई डोंट राइट अगर ये निकाल दिया तो फिर वो कैसे जस्टिफाई फिर वो कैसे समझ में आएगा 
go, 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 kati kati aku ke di tim bas. So that's why it's 400 pages now. He wanted it to be like maybe 300 pages, 280 to be precise. Ma'am, yeah. I am from the publication here, <laughs> so I would like to bring some fact here. This book has sold very well in a very short time. Yes, yes. So that should be a big clap for that. And this innocent face that ma'am has selected for this book, please say something about that to the audience. Yes, I mean this is one of the pictures. I also was looking for a picture which I have not... Of course I knew always that I'm going to write about my childhood, so certain photographs. I kept very carefully. I kept very carefully. I kept very carefully. I kept very carefully. So that. All those pictures were kept aside, and uh, I never wanted to, you know, reveal these pictures, especially this one. Of course, uh, the publishing house had another picture in mind, but I'm, of course, beautiful smile and all that, and I'm wearing a sari. I said, no, not a sari picture. What to baad mein sab ye sab hai, sari and all that, you know, all those filmy photographs. But, but hai to isi from the same year or two later. But I said, no, I don't want the sari look. I want that little <coughs> ribbon in the hair, just as it roughly just tied. And you're a girl, you know. I want that girly look. So I'm 16 here. <laughs> Ma'am, I want to ask you something. Yeah. I'm Sachin Nanavati. Yeah, uh, you, yeah. I've been seeing the interaction. It's so beautiful to know the sensitivities of your uh, each story. Is that fantastic? Thank you. So what I think is that you should really write a particular uh, uh, memoir of the of the life okay. your biography in the same format format of a story <laughs> yeah <laughs> hey, i have bought this i have bought this uh, childhood but the one what i'm talking about is her life now you know that's what i wonderfully uh, depicted wonderfully said an excellent idea. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, I will, you know, I want to write about many other things. It may not be, uh, I find autobiography is a little cumbersome. <laughs> but there are other things that I want to write. I'm certainly, there are four books already in my laptop I'm going to write. So I'm going to keep writing. And because now that, you know, with this book, I've also kind of, uh, Found my bearings as a writer, you know, whatever. I mean, poetry to kisi ne but as a. Yes, we do. Aditi ji, there is a question you see yesterday night. I could have a glance on your book. I am Dr. Divakar Goel. Ji, Divakar ji. And uh, you see, I could see so minutely you have described this really very impossible task to remember. You must be writing diary, it is all okay. But thereafter, you see this narration and you are going for autobiography also. So no. it will be volumes. I'm not now. committing to that. <laughs> you know, I'm telling you, if you, go, if you go with such an exhaustive manner, they're so sensitive, like you are taking a person down the memory lane. Huh. Well, I, one can walk your childhood by reading this. So, and you have the collection of photographs uh, of, <laughs> like that. Yeah, we all have them. I know, what is actually the purpose? As a writer, we have some purpose that this book, a target reader number one. Number two, what do you want? You want to see somewhere people should see role model in you in some of the instances of your career? What is the purpose of the autobiography? No, I what is your own satisfaction? I don't think I had a, I had a target, like, target. I just wanted to, no, it is a childhood that was precious and you I wanted to share it with the world. You are a celebrity, you see. The people across the country, across the world, must have some chapter of your life to be followed. You have in your mind that thing. No. No. You don't want any deeply novel to come like that. As a role model. As a role model. artist, a painter, a thinker. I don't know. I just keep doing my work, whatever comes instinctively. And if that can inspire somebody, I'm very happy. But I, I don't design my life like that. No, I've read your Hindi poetry. It's wonderful. Hopefully it will come. It's so sensitive. It will make a person in years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, on a very light note, I'd like to tell you what I think of Deepthi. And we've been friends yes, now. Yes, so. we've been meeting. Huh? <laughs> so, huh? so uh, we've been friends for hundreds of years. And I really consider her a very fine actress. I think she's a very, very fine actress. She's beautiful voice. She sings like a dream, 
And it used to always fascinate me about her that she does so many things. You know, that she was also painting and she was writing and she was a traveler. She's a wanderer. She'd send me photographs from Spiti and I would say, my God, would I ever have the guts to, uh, to do this? So I really admired her a lot of many things. There's one thing I want to share with you. You see, I consider her a very fine actress. Real life me kya ho mujhe nahi matna. I call her the girl of opposite reactions. Usko jo hai, koi cheez bohat achhi lagi na, to aap me aansu la ke bolegi, Shabana, it was so nice, you know, mujhe itna achha laga, mein bis vaha transfixed ho gai. Phir dousri jaga bolegi, I hated that movie, it was so bad. To me the opposite the life may be girl of opposite reaction. <laughs> I, remember, I remember she used to say that all the time. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so, so very much. Um, new books call for a celebration and the foundation takes utmost pleasure celebrating this new star that is added to the constellation of literature. Shabana ji, Ditti ji, Makra ji, thank you. We are all very honored to have you amongst us today at the book launch. And uh, on behalf of uh, the Prabhakhetan Foundation, I, Karishma Mehta, SS Movement of Mumbai, would like to extend my sincere gratitude to our wonderful, wonderful author, Ditti Naval, our esteemed chief guest, Shabana Azmi, and our very thought-provoking conversationalist, Mr. Makran Pandey, for such an invigorating session. Um, I would also like to thank our presenter, Sri Cement Limited, and our venue and hospitality partner, Taj Land Zen. Last but not the least, uh, we feel that an idea loses its worth without an audience, so we're immensely indebted to you all for being such a wonderful and receptive audience. Have a very, very good evening, and um, can I have uh, Katie with me to present our guests with a small group?